Well, this past Thursday, thousands of people came together at the funeral of Inspector Wayne David. And many of us know him. Uh, he served over 25 years on the force. He was a part of this congregation for almost a decade at our Lincoln location, then at, here at the Capitol turnaround for a number of years. And at the funeral, we heard testimony after testimony of a good man, of a devoted father, of a God-fearer, of a resilient fighter that desired to make the city a better place. And it was an awesome thing to see hundreds upon hundreds of officers at that funeral giving honor to his life. Now I sat there and I have to admit I had a few internal thoughts. One was, I think right now I'm in the safest place in all of the DMV as I look around and see all these officers. Number two, babe, did, did we paid that car registration, right? Like, are we good here? Number three, hope nobody's breaking into our house right now because there ain't nobody covering the city, right? But we're leaning and, and the funeral just full of testimony. But the poignant moment was near the latter end when the DC chief of police got up, Chief Smith, and she stood up and she gave that call that every believer wants to hear. That call from the Almighty, she said, and I believe God in heaven is saying, when he arrived, Wayne David, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And when she said that, people started to stand up and people started to clap and people started to applaud and cheer for a man who had poured out his life for others, poured out his life for God, poured out his life for the city. And as we exited that place, we walked out and there weren't just a few officers outside waiting to lead in that processional. No, I walked out and I actually took some video and we were walking and, and it was officer and it was, it was officers and it was military and men and women and just like person after person after person. You just see like the line of people waiting because of honor to his life, because of honor to a God-fearing, hell-busting, evil-fighting, generously smiling, loyally and committed man to the things of God and to see God advance in this city as well. Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, I have poured my life out as a drink offering for you. I have fought the good fight. I wonder if somebody here looks at that life and says, you know what? Yes, we lost a hero. Yes, we lost a servant of God and a servant of this city, but I'm willing to stand in his stead. I'm willing to step up. I'm willing to fight. I'm willing to put myself in position. I'm willing to lay down my, my selfishness and pick up selflessness. I'm willing to lay down my fear and pick up faith. I'm willing to lay down my will so I can pick up thy will. I wonder if somebody has some fight them. Go ahead and turn to your neighbor and say, fight the good fight. <laughs> we're willing to fight, but it's usually we're willing to fight the petty fight, right? <laughs> well, I see how it is. You're gonna, we're in church and you're going to take the armrest? Oh, you're going to take that armrest? We're a generous church right now and you're going to take that armrest. Right, nobody's using the armrest right now, right? <laughs> Oh, okay, to, you know, to your significant other, your roommate. Oh, we're going to use that tone in this conversation. Oh, that, that's the tone that we're going to use. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we're going to use that tone. All right. And we fight the petty fight, don't we? But who's willing to fight the good fight? What does it mean to fight the good fight? Second Timothy chapter four, you heard it from Sam. That's our text today, verses one through eight. And we're going to look there in just a moment. But as we know, uh, Paul has penned this book from prison in Rome. And Paul understands something, that death is imminent, that the end is near for him. And we know from history that it will come very soon after this. And so he's staring death in the face. I wonder if you've ever walked with somebody who knows that death is at the front door. You ever talked with somebody because you know, they're not going to tell you about their trophies, are they? They're going to tell you about their accolades. They're, they're going to give you what is absolutely critical 
and important and of highest value to pass on to you. And that's where we find the Apostle Paul in this book, throughout this book. And now here we are at the very end of his letter to Timothy. And he even ratchets it up another level in verse one. Here's what it says. He says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Can you sense the tone right here, right? Timothy, my days are short, but I charge you with this right here. He says, I charge you to preach the word. Somebody say preach. Preach. Pre you can go ahead and say that to me while I'm preaching up here. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> preach, preach the word. He says, preach the word. He doesn't say, preach the most recent book that you've been in. Preach that new idea that you're kind of excited about, that you heard, that new philosophy. He doesn't say, preach your best political ideology. Preach about that political figure because they're so much better and we would be in such trouble if the other one gets it. He doesn't say that. He says what? He says, preach the word. Yeah. What's the word? There's two elements to the word. Number one is the written word. It's the logos. It's the inspired word of God. It's this book, the good book that he gives us that gives guidance and wisdom and insight and revelation. This is a gift to us. He gives us the written word, but also there's something called the living word. John chapter one says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. It's talking about Jesus, that Jesus is the living word. And so to preach the word, you got to preach Jesus. You want peace? You got to come to Jesus. You want hope? You got to make your way to Jesus. Here's the way that Bill Johnson said it. He said this, he said, I owe them more than a message. I owe them the messenger. There's a responsibility in this pulpit to preach the word. We have a responsibility in this pulpit and there's events all through the week and we got different things going on. It's really fun during the week. What is happening here? When this pulpit comes up here, we're going to preach the word that we're going to honor that in this house. But can I also tell you something? This scripture is not just for pastors. This scripture is for all of us to preach the word, this Greek word uh, that is preach. It's, it's the word keruso. It means to announce, to proclaim, to set forth, to deliver, to make known. This can be done over a cup of coffee. Did you know that? It can be done in your car going somewhere with somebody else. It can be done in your office. It can be done chatting with a neighbor. This can be done anywhere at any time with anybody. We are called to preach the word. If God has given you relationship, he's given you opportunity. Verse two, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Paul is giving an imperative here to be aware, to be ready, to be prepared for any opportunity that might arise. The best opportunities come in unexpected moments, don't they? When you're not re ready in life, your best opportunities will come when you didn't have the chance to prepare for those things. We see it with Jesus. Jesus is on his way when the woman grabs the hem of his garment and power goes out into and the miracle occurs. Jesus was on his way to the city when he spoke to the fig tree. Jesus was on his way elsewhere when the rich young ruler came along and grabbed him, dropped to his feet. And we had this powerful moment of discipleship. Constantly, Jesus is on his way somewhere else. When he stopped, an opportunity arises. The miracle often happens on the way to do whatever it is you want to do. Opportunities come, but are we ready? to preach the word in season and out of season. If I hang with Brandon Irwin, there's a good chance that we're going to pray for somebody's healing. If I hang out with Ernest Clover, there's a good chance we're going to initiate a new relationship and somehow share our faith. That if they are within 20 square feet of his radius, it's going to happen. If I hang out with Deb and Cliff Porter, there's a good chance that somebody in their pathway is going to get an onslaught of encouragement because yeah. that's who they are. And guess what? 
they don't understand the difference between seasons because they are full of the word of God, whether they are in season or out of season, every season is their season to produce word from their lives. Are you ready in season or out? One conviction that I've grasped for living and giving the gospel on a daily basis is very simply this. If you want to give the gospel, you got to have something to give. You got to have something in your spirit. If you want to get to preach the word, you got to have a word. So I simply ask you today, if what's the word? If I ask you, hey, what's the word? What do you got? Do you have something in your spirit to give away? I asked that question to Sam, who was just up here. I asked him this weekend, what's the word? And he said, you know what? He said, I got contacted twice by my family of origin and, and it triggered some things into me. And I just started to lean in and try to control the situation. And I found myself getting really stressed out and I had to come to God in prayer. And when I did, he called me to release that, to let go of it. He gave me a sense of trust and God gave me freedom in that moment. So what's the word? He just poured out some word in 20 seconds to me. Isn't that awesome? He had something in season or out ready to go. And you say, you know what? But somebody in my neighborhood is not going to come up to me and ask me, so what's the word today, right? <laughs> but you know what they might ask? Hey, how you doing? Man, let me tell you, my family of origin just contacted me and kind of set some things off. I don't know if you ever have some challenges with your family, right? Because I, oh, you do? Yeah, me too. But can I tell you about something? I went to God in prayer and it totally changed the equation, right? If you are ready in season and out, there will be opportunity. Opportunities will arise if you're ready. And so on a daily basis, go to the Lord in word and prayer and ask him this question. Are you ready? Write this down if you're taking notes. If you're on your app, you can see it in the app. Ask this question. God, what do you want to give me today? that I can give away? Simple question. God, what do you want to give me today that I can give away to those around me? And I got to ask that if you ask this question, you will be empowered through the spirit and you will equip your own mind. I don't know if some people are like me in the room that that reading retention does not come naturally to you. Am I the only one here? I mean, I am on the low end of the low end of reading retention. <laughs> I mean, I read, I, hey, babe, what are you doing? I just knocked out six chapters. Oh, what'd you learn? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> God. <right? laughs> Bible. Like, you know, and I'm like, I read and then all of a sudden I look down. I'm like, man, I need to go back like five pages. I have no idea the words that came off of that in my mind. So I got to trick my mind. And if you're like me, if reading retention does not come by nature, I'm going to tell you about the enemy. Uh, the enemy, it, it, it's called this, the forgetting curve. Some people would call it the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. And we go back to 1885. OK, Herman Ebbinghaus. Uh, it was a research project, and it was the first to demonstrate exponential loss of memory unless information is reinforced. In other words, 20 minutes after you just read something, half of that, poof, it's gone. <laughs> unless you reinforce that information. How do you do that? You, simple things like, like underlining or highlighting or or making notes. And I don't know, you know, when Pastor Mark talks, he's got all these, I, I do the left dog ear, the right dog ear, the, you know, he's got all these tricks and you can see how retention comes so naturally to him. And so you have to, you have to take initiative, but, or as Leon Ho put it, I like this. Uh, he said to retain knowledge, have a question or purpose in mind before you start reading. The science Reinforms a, rein, uh, reinforces a simple assignment that I'm trying to give you today, and that's this. When you go to the Lord in prayer, when you go to God in your word, start by asking a question. God, what do you desire to give me today that I can then give away to somebody else? Ask that question and don't leave your time until you get it. 
until you got it in your spirit. If somebody comes up and asks me, what's the word? How you doing? Here's what I got to give today. Go to the Lord with that question and he will show up. We often say it this way. The goal isn't to get through the word. The goal is to get the word through me. God, have your way in me. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. It's kind of interesting because Paul, he gives three different approaches here. Isn't that interesting? Don't just come one way every time. No, here's different approaches that we bring the word to other people. Correct, rebuke, encourage. Now, John Stott said this. He said, this is not a biblical warrant for rudeness. Come on, we needed to hear that, right? Sometimes we see this, we read this. Okay, here I go. I'm going to dive in and we just go for it. But, but here's the thing. It doesn't mean that you are to push the gospel on people who don't want it. Like a boy scout who walks the older woman across the street, but she didn't want to go across the street. She was going the other way, right? So John Stott says, this is not a biblical warrant for rudeness, but a biblical appeal against laziness. He's saying, be ready, be prepared. Here's how. Be prepared for those opportunities that might come. Correct to repu, excuse me, to reprove, to convince, to persuade, to bring light into. Rebuke, it's to warn, to call out a path that somebody is going down that might lead towards trouble and treachery. To encourage, it's to build up with patience to not grow weary in doing good for those around you. So he gives these three things. And it wasn't like, all right, here's three things. You pick one and then you do that every time. No, here's three things. And Jesus did it this way. To some, he came and he warned, right? To others, he came and he encouraged. To others, he came and he touched. To some, he came and he was present with. To others, he came and he started drawing art in the sand, right? <laughs> to each he came uniquely, the same as our call when we're sharing the word. Be unique in those instances. Every person is different and every moment is different. So come with an awareness of the spirit and then notice what Paul does. He addresses posture. And we're gonna get into this for the next four weeks, so I won't go deep here. But he says this, he says, do these things with patience, and with careful instruction. So it's not just about content, it's about tone. It's about posture. It's about the way things are delivered and understanding our own uh, misconceptions and challenges. Philip of Assis said this, he said, you know you're preaching the gospel when people are compelled by grace to believe instead of being coerced by guilt to behave. Verse three, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and they will turn aside to myths. I'll never forget the story of a young man who came over to the Ebenezer's coffee house and we were having a baptism service down in the, in the performance space. And so he wandered down into the baptism service and he came that day for a cup of coffee, but he got a cup of conviction that day. He got a cup of grace that day. And it started him on a path of faith to Jesus. And over the coming weeks, he ended up sharing this with his boss and it kind of changed his, his work because new values were coming into his life. And so he shared it with his boss and his his boss didn't like it. And so he went to our church website. He found our core beliefs. He printed out the core beliefs. And then he had a confrontation and he sat him down. Do you know what this church believes? I'm going to tell you what the, they believe. And, and he sat him down and he started going through our core beliefs one by one. He said, do you believe that Jesus is the son of God? It was kind of a moment for him. He said, yeah, yes, I do. So do you believe the Bible is the inspired, the authoritative word of God? Yes, I do. He said, do you believe we find ourselves far from God? I'm just reading off our core beliefs right now. 
we find ourselves far from God because of sin, but that Jesus came as the son of God, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for you and I, but defeated death and its sting and was resurrected to the right hand of God. And what started as an inquisition of faith turned into a confession of faith. Yes, I absolutely believe that. We are here, and you know what? In this church, in this house, we're going to preach the word. We're going to do our best to bring sound doctrine to this house. We're going to give it everything we got, and we're going to continue to lean into our core beliefs that we believe there is one God with three persons. There is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe He is eternal. He is immortal. He is infinite. He is everlasting. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. We believe when we put our faith in Jesus Christ that it ignites a spiritual chain reaction and produces evidence of our salvation, that we are forgiven of sin, declared righteous before God, and given eternal life in Him, that we are made new in Christ. We believe that. Last week, Pastor Mark unpacked 2 Timothy chapter 3. And here's what it says. In the last days, people will be lover of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love. Are you encouraged yet? <laughs> Unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Do you feel like we're itching your ears? <laughs> That doesn't sound like preaching that just is stuff that we want to hear, right? Here's what Jackie Hill Perry said. She said it this way. There is a preacher for every passion. If you have uncrucified passions, you will be tempted to listen to teachers that accommodate your flesh. Listen, listen, listen. And give you a way out of repentance. That's not an ear tickle. That's a gut punch. I thank God that I had people to preach repentance. I don't know where I would be today in my faith and life if I didn't understand some level what repentance means. It means to turn around, to be renewed, to be transformed in the mind by God and to begin starting. to. That's Jesus, this is Jesus' primary message. You know that? Jesus says, turn from your ways, repent, and come follow me. We have a call to repentance. She went on to say, there is a trend towards a narcissistic, self-centered, self-oriented hermeneutic being imposed on every biblical text. Out of it, not extracted self-denial or death to self or mind renewal or holiness or love of neighbor or love of God. Into the text, it is imposed. Everything is about me, about my purpose, about my life, about my marriage. It's about my season, my, 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 my. We love that kind of teaching because we love ourselves. We've forgotten the reality that we were made for God. Everything exists for God, for his value, for his glory, for his worship. But we want ear candy. We want somebody to affirm our already assumptions, right? Our already grudges, our already footholds. Man, I don't have time to get into emotional idolatry. Oof. Okay. <laughs> Trying to be disciplined here. Oh, I'm going to come back to that. We'll see if I got time. Verse 5. But you keep your head in all situations. The enemy of our soul desires to cloudy your mind. He desires to, to bring confusion, does he not? That's his desire. Confusion, the opposite of unity. God desires to bring you clarity of thought, clarity of mind. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. You're called to a battle. Do you know that? 
And the people around you, the people in your office, they're going to give up. They're going to throw in the towel. But guess what? You're not. Why? Because you have a deeper tank. Because you've been given the Spirit who gives you resilience and resolve to keep on enduring. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Speak. Share. Live your faith. And then discharge the duties of your ministry. The ESV says fulfill your ministry. It's, it's kind of a combo platter here, right? One is discharge the duties and so allow others to, to step in and to do their duties. You don't do their thing. You let them do it. But you fulfill your ministry. So we're, in regards to our church community, our church family right here, whether you're in the house or online, like we have an opportunity to step in. And last week we had our Connect Expo, Right. Because it's, it's a great moment to step in. Right now we have small groups starting up. You can find any small group. If you go here to the link behind me, ncc.re slash connect, you can see small group opportunities. Tomorrow, Alpha kicks off. Tomorrow, you can jump in on Alpha. By the way, online, I think, I believe we have an online Alpha this year as well. Great opportunities. Today, after second service, basic training of the prophetic. We have countless small groups that you can jump into right now to find community. But it's a bit of a gut check here because when we're a part of this family right here, a couple of things are happening. One, we receive love within a community. We find acceptance and revelation, and that's an awesome thing. But two, there is purpose. We should be adding value to this church family. And so we got to have a gut check. We got to say, okay, am I just getting one out of two? You know, I, I love coming because I usually get something. I usually feel encouraged. But what about that second piece? Are you adding value? Are you finding your place of purpose within the body? Find a way to serve. Let me just call out our youth ministry now. It's kicking like karate. Things are moving and shaking with our youth. And but I also see there are some opportunities for some people to step in. I'm not talking about, hey, if you got a a Sunday to show up. I mean, like we need some people who would step in and be committed What an opportunity to help disciple and encourage a next generation, to fan into flame the gift of God and some Timothy. We have some Timothys out there. I wonder if there's some Pauls in the congregation. And so we have some opportunity. Can I just say our parking team? Can we thank God for our parking team right now? And and praise God, because we just thanked like three people. It would be great to thank some more people. We need some parking team attendance. Like, and there's, there's production team, there's kids ministry, there's all these different ways to plug in. But step in, connect, use your giftings, fulfill your ministry. The Apostle Paul is encouraging us. Verse six, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Last week, Nina and I celebrated our 20th anniversary. How about that? And I I just thank God for my wife. There is nobody in the world that I love. There you are. I love you too, Zeke, but but I love more than my wife. That's not the point of this. Every five years, we, we go big. We take a trip together our 20th. So we went to Barcelona, Spain, you guys. Do you know what a siesta is? Do you know what tapas are? Oh my goodness. I can teach you some Spanish. Those are my two favorite Spanish words. But we went to Barcelona, Spain. And, and at one point we, we got to go around the Olympic stadium. And if you remember, it was 1992 that Barcelona ho- hosted the Olympics and the stadium hosted the track and field championships. And it's one of the all time iconic Olympic moments. If you remember this, it was Derek Redman. Uh, he was a British athlete and he was a favorite for a medal in the 400 meter sprint. And so they got out of the race, the gun goes off. He started in that race. It was about 250 meters to go when a devastating moment happened. He tears his hamstring and he slows down and then he goes down to the ground, you guys. He is on the ground as everybody else finished, but he wasn't done. You know why? Because he had some fight in him. Some other people around him had some fight in them. And I just want to take a moment just to see some of the images from that iconic moment. So check this out on the screen.
Does life ever feel like that? Does life ever feel like that where things are cooking, things are moving, things are shaking, things are going, and then pain hits, then hurt hits, then devastation comes, and you go down, and your dreams go down, and your expectations go down, and it all goes down. And, and, but what a powerful moment that we see in those images because we see a man who is down on the ground, but he's got too much fight on him to stay down on the ground. He's going to get up and he's going to hobble his way, right? He's, he will not be denied that thing. He's going to hobble his way and he's going to give everything he got. But guess what? Everything he got is not enough. And so the father comes out from the stands. And his father runs and he pushes through the guards. The guards are trying to stop him. No, you can't go out there, sir. And he gets out there and he grabs his son and he puts his arm around him. And the guards come again and they push, push him. Get, what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? And he takes his son and he helps him and they continue and they, and they cross the finish line together. What a moment it is when the son doesn't have enough. But he's got resolve in his spirit and his father will get him across that finish line. Look at it another way, though. When you look back on that iconic moment and you remember it, here's the thing. You don't remember who won the race, do you? You remember who finished the race. My friend Steve said it this way. He said, nobody remembers who won the race. Everybody remembers who finished that race. You're a finisher. Can I declare that in the house today? Finish the race. I wish I could tell you something today. I wish I could tell you, listen, I wish I could tell you that things are going to be easy. I wish I could tell you that, that everything's going to go your way. If you just follow God, it'll all be good. That feels good. It's like tickling your ears, right? I wish I could tell you that hardship won't come. I wish I could tell you that adversity won't be in your path. I wish I could tell you that people won't let you down. I wish I could tell you you won't go down in life at some point. I wish I could tell you that you won't have to get up and, and limp through a season. I wish I could tell you you don't need somebody to come alongside and put their arm around you today. But if I preach the word, I have to tell you the opposite because it's what Jesus says. He says hardship will come. Adversity will show up at your door. He says, trouble is going to come. Mourning will come. But guess what? Joy will come in the morning. But guess what? He says, I have overcome the world, so take heart. But guess what? He says, I will be with you even until the very end of the age. So we find strength in God. And if we're willing to step up, if we're willing to step out, God will say some mighty, meaningful words to us. Well done. Well done. Now good and faithful servant. Just like thousands of people and hundreds of officers rose up to clap and to applaud and to cheer and to celebrate the life of Wayne David. Guess what? Right after that, the mayor gets up and says this, she addresses his children. And she says this, she says, your daddy was a protector of this city. We need some protectors to stand up. We need some faithful people to stand up. We need some people to step out and fight, some people to offer their lives and say, I'm ready, I'm here, I am willing, I'm available. Here's my heart, God. And when we do, when we do, God will look, he'll respond. And all of a sudden that arm is around you, pull you in and you'll finish that race. Do I have some finishers in the house today? I said, do I have some finishers in the house today? Do I have some fighters in the house today? Do I have some people who are ready to stand up today, who are ready to step into the will and the purposes of God today? I wonder if you'll just stand with me. And here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, we're going to worship. I want to invite our prayer team down to the altar. And we're going to open up the altar as we worship in just a moment. If you'd like to pray with somebody, our prayer team will be here ready to pray with you. But I'd love to just make a confession of faith to close out this sermon at, right before we worship. And so this might be your first time 
You say, I've never put my faith in Jesus and I'm ready today. It's my moment. It's my confession moment. This might be the 5,000th time that you've done this. But I wonder if all of us today would just speak and declare, if, if you believe this, a confession of faith in our Lord. And so you'll see it up on the screen. If we could put that up behind me. And we're going to say this together. Will you join me in, to declare this and to pray it? Join me now. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I surrender my life, past, present, future, time, talent, treasure, heart, soul, mind, and strength to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. Amen.